Yakuza 6, the first ever PS4 exclusive Yakuza game, was released in Japan at the end of 2016, with it then later coming everywhere else in 2018. The game then later worked its way towards Xbox and PC, where it released in early 2021. It was released after Yakuza Kiwami, and then released before Yakuza Kiwami 2. But the big thing to note was that it was the first game using the brand new Dragon engine, which was a revolutionary new engine for the franchise. For many reasons, beyond just the engine, Yakuza 6 was the third and as of right now final revolution for the Yakuza series. To start, let's talk about some little quality of life features with this game. My favourite thing that this game added was the lack of loading screens between indoor and outdoor sections, meaning that if you were to walk into a restaurant, you can just walk right in and there you go, you're in. There are some buildings that have loading zones in quotation marks, however, it's actually just because that there's a little animation where it will fade to black so that you can be warped to the correct area. Two examples of that are elevators where you just get teleported to the other side of the elevator, and something like the bar Earth Angel where the scaling of the interior was kind of scuffed and wouldn't be able to accurately fit in the champion district, so you just get warped somewhere else as well. Then a fan favourite feature is the ability to whip out your phone and take some photos, whether it be a scenic landscape or just a funny photo of Kiryu's face. The inventory was also reworked, so now rather than only having a max of however many items, you instead have a pseudo infinite inventory. You can hold up to typically 10 items of every different type of item, which is nicer for convenience sake, but it does make it a bit easy being able to have a million healing items. Vending machines are also finally interactable, so you can have a cheeky few sips of a drink to gain a specific temporary stat buff, like an attack one. Another thing was that saving anywhere had now become a staple, and save points were completely removed, besides them sometimes being there in Yakuza Like a Dragon, but they had specific purposes. Ishin let you save anywhere, Zero could originally allow you to save anywhere in the PC version if you fiddled with some files, although that later got removed, and Yakuza Kiwami let you save anywhere you wanted, but as I've learnt, that was apparently only a PC thing, or at least, it wasn't on the PS4. Every game from Yakuza 6 and onwards, except for one stupid little exception, allowed you to save anywhere. And while that's all for general quality of life improvements with the original release, the two ports had two little things as well. There was a small thing that only I would care about, where you can adjust the UI to fit within 16x9 borders on aspect ratios beyond that, meaning that my 21x9 footage can still have the HUD and it won't get cut out, which I think only Yakuza 0 and Kiwami 1 did. But then with specifically the Xbox port, you can utilise the Series S and X's boost modes to get up to 60fps, but then because the version of the game that you can play on the PS5 is still the untouched original PS4 version, it means that the game is still only in 30 FPS. I know some people don't mind, but it is a little unfortunate. Anyway, now onto the true meat of the game, being its combat. The combat of this game compared to other entries is a little controversial. Not because it caused a great stir in the community, but more just that it had a few little things that some people liked and others didn't. The most notable thing is that everyone has ragdoll physics whenever they get hit, which if you don't know what that means, it's when a character will go all limp and their limbs and whatnot bounce all around. In the previous games, when you would knock an enemy to the ground or get knocked back yourself, they'd have set trajectories and animations and instead of being sort of randomly done. This meant that you could follow up with attacks a bit easier because you could predict what was going to happen, but with the Dragon Engine's ragdoll physics, sometimes they just go a little bit away and you can run in and kick someone, but other times they will just go sailing across the universe and you have to chase after them for longer than you should. Another thing is physics that are tied to objects. Previous games have allowed for things like chairs and cans to be kicked and thrown around, but now everything flies around with a bit more randomness. However, as you can see from this clip, the physics can be a bit much. Although, a feature that they added that makes the ridiculous physics a lot more fun to mess around with is that there are a lot more breakable objects. Previously you could only break objects by doing something like using them in combat and smashing them over someone's head, but now you can just run into them whenever and it's a hell of a lot of fun to just sprint into signs that are in your way and destroy them rather than just literally stepping around them. So then the combat might suffer from these newly introduced physics as sometimes they can get a bit out of hand and be hard to deal with, but they do make it so that you giggle a lot more when everything just explodes. Another thing this game introduced was a complete and total overhaul of Kiryu's main fighting style. Unlike the previous three games, Kiryu has now gone back to just having one, and the one is kinda shitty to be honest. It's still the Dragon of Dojima style with all of the animations and attack properties being different, but the way it plays is the exact same in essence. First change I'll mention with it is how throws work. When you grab someone and press the light or heavy attack buttons, you still do basically the same thing you've always done, but now when you press the grab button again, you'll spin the enemy around in circles before you chuck them. This new throw has its benefits, for example being able to hit other enemies while you're swinging around, being able to throw enemies into other ones much easier, and being able to just throw dudes into rivers or something and instantly killing them. However, it does also have downsides, with the big one being that if an enemy even remotely touches a nearby wall, you'll just drop them and do nothing. Considering you launch the enemy as well, it means that you can't throw someone to the ground and attack them like you used to, but now the enemy's just like, Bye Kiryu, I'm going home! Another change is the combos. They still control the exact same, with four light attacks that you can string together, with each step in the combo having a finisher that you can do at any stage. I also could be wrong, but I'm 
pretty sure you start with double finishes in this game and it isn't something you have to unlock, but anyway, yeah, you also have double finishes. They all kind of do the exact same thing of just sending the enemy flying away and there's no reason to go for any specific finisher or anything, meaning that you can get away with just mashing buttons and nothing bad will ever really happen. You also still have finishing holds, although unlike previous games where they all stand out from each other, all four finishing holds in Yakuza 6 are just you grab a guy and spin in a circle. And also, it's sometimes pretty easy for an enemy to hit the wall while you do them, meaning that when you do one, your attack gets interrupted. The only one that doesn't really have that problem is one where you sort of tuck the guy into you, but beyond that, they just kind of suck. If you want to grab an enemy and spin them into other enemies, you just have to grab them and spin them, unlike in older games where finishing holds were the only way to do that. But one thing this game did sort of improve on were the evade strikes. The forward evade strike doesn't go anywhere near as far, but it is much faster and doesn't leave you anywhere near as open. The sideways ones aren't as good, but they have more range than the old ones. Then there's the backwards one, which no longer has the stun properties that it used to, but you don't have to set up very specific circumstances to actually ever land it, because now Kiryu evades back and jumps forward, which can launch the enemy. I've said it in videos in the past, but the Vort Evade Strike is something that is incredibly cheesy to use on enemies, as they stand there doing nothing and just accept defeat every time. Also, evading is pretty much like the Rush Styles evades from Zero and Kiwami 1. There's also a special evade that you can do when you press evade after running, which then lets you do a big commando roll, but I've literally never found a single use for that, because it's kind of slow and awkward, and I honestly would have just preferred Dharma Tumblr to evade roll, but yeah. Then there's also the charge attacks, which suck fat cock, and the big drop kick attack, which is weirdly overpowered. Now for a bunch of brand new things, and some completely removed things. For starters, the game has a brand new playable area that the story largely revolves around, being Onomichi in Hiroshima. Then when it comes to gameplay mechanics, when you hit an enemy's guard, your attacks bounce off them. It doesn't really do too much besides slow you down slightly, so it's kind of an annoying feature, but you can at least bounce an enemy's attacks off of your own guard. There's also a parry like some other games where you press guard right before getting hit, although it doesn't have properties like the Ishin one where you become invincible or anything like that. Yakuza 6 removed equipable weapons, and weapons that are found on the ground all have 3 durability, meaning that after 3 hits they will all break. Even if you pistol whip someone 3 times, the gun will break, even though usually pistols have infinite durability but limited ammo. The game also got rid of technically all of the Komaki abilities, with the technical part being that it's just called Tiger Drop and not Komaki Tiger Drop, but in essence the only one that actually was removed is Komaki Knockback. Taunting was another thing that was completely removed for some reason. There's also a new level up mechanic where doing things such as defeating enemies and doing sub stories will grant you specific experience points that are separated into five categories. You then use various combination of these experience points like 50 red ones and 10 blue ones or something to either gain a new ability or to increase a stat. The cost of things are a bit all over the place but it was optimized a bit better in Kiwami 2 which was the only other game to have it. It's an alright idea but you get situations like having 9999 red points with nothing to spend them on because you need like 10 purple ones or some bullshit and the game just refuses to give them to you. An ability like Tiger Drop is an intentionally expensive ability in this game because it's very good, but the dumbest prices are located with the dumbest new idea that the game had. So rather than starting with one or two bars of heat, you start with three orbs of heat. Heat is only consumed by heat actions and extreme heat mode, which I'll get into in a bit, but when you're upgrading your heat gauge in other games, it's done so that you can consume your heat a bit more freely. However, upgrading your orbs in Yakuza 6 costs 800 XP in all five categories, meaning that you need to get essentially a total of 4,000 points to unlock one extra heat orb. So if you want to get the other two, you need to go do that again two more times. It's not that it's so expensive that you need to grind for six hours, but it's that the most expensive skills in the game, such as an upgraded tiger drop, max combo speed, max heat action damage, or the max amount of quick steps are all cheaper than getting one single heat orb. Don't know what the hell they were thinking too, because you and I'm not just exaggerating when I say this, legitimately only need one heat orb to beat the entire game. And that's because you only need to get one heat orb to activate extreme heat, which allows you to do a fair few heat action for it to then run out and you get another heat orb immediately. Speaking of which, this game adds a new mechanic called Extreme Heat, which is basically like Kiryu's thing in Yakuza 5 where it glows red and turns invincible. Real quick, I want to say that you're not invincible with Extreme Heat like I accidentally said in another video, but you can't die while it's active. Extreme Heat changes up your combo so that all light attacks are just the same left and right hooks, but the point behind it is that you can mash it over and over again and get a big special heat action off of it. And as if the light attack combo didn't already just look like the same punches being thrown over and over, with Extreme Heat it literally is, but anyway. The main purpose of Extreme Heat is that you can get some different charge attacks which are much better than your standard ones, and that you have access to a whole new range of heat actions. Likely because they wanted this game to be very fresh, there's significantly more brand new heat actions than reused ones, which is actually kind of surprising for this series. Most of the heat actions are through Extreme Heat, and then without Extreme Heat, a lot of them you can only do under fairly specific conditions, like grabbing an enemy when you're in a convenience store. Some of the old heat actions have actually been tweaked slightly to better fit the style of Yakuza 6's new heat actions. So for example, this one from 
from Majima and Yakuza 0, where you punch a guy and kick him off a ledge, is in Yakuza 6 when you're standing at this staircase. But where the animation slows down in Yakuza 0 is when Majima punches and kicks the guy, which really adds a lot of emphasis to it. But in Yakuza 6, there is no slow motion, and the camera doesn't cut, with it instead having a big camera sweep. This is a perfect example of Yakuza 6's unique style to the hit actions. If you go through and watch a video on all of them, you'll notice several instances of the camera doing these big sweeps or quick punch zooms, and there's a lot more emphasis on speed ramping, which means it'll slow down or speed back up. When the Yakuza games have some slow motion and a hit action, it's not like slow motion footage in real life where you simply slow everything down, and that's because the animators have to actually animate it in a way that gives off the illusion of proper slow motion. So that means that they physically time Majima's punch so that his fist sort of stays there for a while, with the enemy reacting in a sort of slow motion way, again to give off the illusion of slow motion. It is quite literally like just pretending like you're in slow motion in real life and going all the reason why I bring all that up is because of Yakuza 6's heavy use of speed ramps. A lot of the heat actions do look cool, but the way that they slow down for a very short period of time and then speed up quite a lot was obviously done to make them all a bit shorter and more to the point. It's the same philosophy that Smash Ultimate has with its final smashes, where they wanted to make them quick and to the point, but I feel that that does strip a lot of the appeal of the heat actions because it's kind of like they're just going, yeah, yeah, you've seen it before, let's move on. That being said, the way the camera is done for Yakuza 6's heat actions it's quite nice, as it feels more like an action movie with the camera constantly shifting around to get as nice a view as possible on all of the action, but sometimes it can feel a bit ADHD-y. Like I've been saying though, this was a uniquely Yakuza 6 thing. Kiwami 2 had some new heat actions, but I do believe almost all of them were from previous games, with their animation data and properties just being copied exactly. So the real game to look at is Judgment, where the heat actions are much closer to the old games, while still blending in some of the style of 6. The camera isn't all wishy-washy, and there are a few speed ramps, but when it does ramp up the speed, it's typically just to either go back to normal, or for stuff like when Yagami will dash forward at lightning speeds, but that's more like something with only a few animated frames to give off the illusion of speed, rather than what 6 does, where it clumps all the keyframes closer together so that the attack is faster. With Extreme Heat, the heat actions where you mash a button to deal more damage always have a very, oh, we're back, okay, kind of transitions. I don't know how else to explain it, but some of them are just weird and kind of shitty compared to a regular heat action that feels like it has a final impact and a smooth transition back into combat. But finally, the long battles and a lot of enemy encounters are kind of ruined by the developer's desire to show just how many enemies they can fit onto screen. I can guarantee that now that they didn't have to worry about the PS3 and had a new engine, they made it so that so many fights have like 20 enemies that all have 1 HP. You'll find yourself grabbing one guy and spinning him around a bunch, which gets kind of boring. They can still be good, like the final one in particular, but it ruins a lot of the impact when you walk into a room and there's like 50 dudes that all just flop to the floor and are nothing but basically potholes in your road ahead. All in all, this game made the most standout changes amongst all the other games. It can contained some improvements, but in other areas it did take a few steps backwards. Some things they seemingly went back on, while others may have just been a few teething problems. Considering they made a brand new engine for the game and wanted so many new things, it seems like they were sort of crushed under the weight of their own expectations. But at the very least, those general quality of life improvements I mentioned a while back, as well as things like the beautiful lighting of the Dragon Engine, make me grateful that Yakuza 6 did at least exist. So now we come to the story, which is a bit of an oddity in a way. On its own, it's an entertaining story with great characters, as these games always have had, and everything to do with Somia is based. But what it was supposed to be was Kiryu's last hurrah. We obviously know now that that's not at all the case, but back then it was essentially the conclusion to his life so that they can make room for characters like Ichiban and Yagami. So what I'm always stuck wondering is, why wasn't the story more of a celebration of Kiryu's life? To me, it feels like when they were halfway through writing the story, someone on the writing team slammed their hands on the desk and went, I'm sick of him! I hate Kiri. I don't want to write stories about him anymore. And then everyone else in the room just sort of looked around at each other and said, yeah, right, let's, let's just do that. Now, obviously, people don't like cheap fan service like how Atlas games these days just chuck in something Persona 5 related. But to not wrap neat little bows on things from other games, even if they were very slight, was a bit of a missed opportunity. They didn't have to work the story around that at all, considering that most of the time villains from past games die or go to jail. So it would have been ridiculous if they wrote some story about like, I don't know, the Jingwon Mafia just coming back or something. But again, with Yakuza 6, there were so many things that could have gotten even a slight mention or a bit of focus to allow for the game to have been a proper celebration of Kiryu's life. I mean, biggest example of them passing that opportunity up is the fact that Majima, a character as iconic as Kiryu himself, was just kind of deleted out of the game. I mean, even Fist of the North Star Lost Paradise technically had a Majima boss fight in it, and they even gave him an intro with a little explanation as to who he was, just for him to not be relevant at all. You see, you could argue that referencing a bunch of things from previous games would alienate new players, which despite it being the sixth entry 
of the series, the creators of the game very clearly wanted and were hoping new players would be interested considering they have story recaps and summaries, as well as it being a very fresh new take on the gameplay as I've discussed. I would agree on that. But you know what they could have done? During Kiryu's prison time at the start of the game, obviously they're all much older now, but it would have been a nice little note if the Ryudo family from Yakuza 3 would check in on the kids just to make sure they're alright. Then another small thing that could have been done was that maybe when Kiryu's sorting some shit out in Little Asia, Date makes some passing remark about how he might need to grab Tanimura to help with some translation. He doesn't actually have to go and get him to help them, but it would have been nice to know if he's even alive. And speaking of the police, what if you just got a little letter from Joji Kazuma at some point? Considering Joji Kazuma is basically his uncle, I'm sure he'd care enough to speak to him at some point after what happens in Yakuza 3. Or how about this one? Before a big long battle, Akiyama's all, hmm, we're gonna need all the help we can get. It'd be good if we could get that Shinada guy's help, but he's been living it up big time in Major League Baseball. You probably saw one of his games when you are in jail, Kiryu. Now then, if you couldn't tell, my biggest issue I've always had with the stories of the Yakuza games is how they just sort of <laughs> pretend like previous games never happened. I mean, even in Yakuza 6, besides Majima, none of the characters I just mentioned even get a mere whisper. Obviously, 6 is a sequel to 5, but Zero was the most recent game before 6, and ironically, that game didn't even get a story recap. Because then, in quite the contrast, the pocket circuit fighter from Yakuza 0 shows up, and it's a heartwarming reunion between him and Kiryu. You get to see where his life's taken him, and you get to help him move on to the future. It's nice, it's a good sentiment, but it doesn't change the core story or anything, but instead, a good friend of Kiryu's is just given a little send-off. That is, before he was then in Like a Dragon. They also included Yuya, and he's like, hey guys, here's what's been going down recently. And while it's not in Yakuza 6, the next game of Kiwami 2 had the perfect example of referencing past games with some closure. The Majima Saga has a section of it dedicated to wrapping up a neat little bow on the love story between Majima and Makoto from Yakuza 0, but it's so precisely perfect. Makoto doesn't full sprint into Majima's arms and shouts out her love for him or anything like that, nor does Majima even say anything to her that could give away who he was. And this was because Majima wanted to be forgotten. So considering Zero was made after Yakuza 1 through 5, Majima having zero mention of Makoto makes perfect sense for a multitude of reasons. We didn't even need that closure, but the fact that we got it anyway just makes me more angry that Six tried so hard to be its own thing, with it only really having references to previous story beats like a Tojo clan power struggle or a story about fatherhood and whatever. But the last thing that they definitely should have done is they should have made Somiya the final boss because he's a way cooler character than the actual final boss, but mm, that's just me. Alright, but the video still isn't over because I have one additional thing I'd like to mention, and it's related to the soundtrack. Although the usual Yakuza composers were all here for Yakuza 6, the direction of the game's soundtrack feels a little different than before, which might be thanks to the direction by Chihiro Aoki. Once again, it was obviously to emphasize this new generation of Yakuza games, but it's not at all a problem. It still sounds like Yakuza music, but it's a bit hard to describe what I'm trying to say beyond it feels a bit different. What I will say though is that the audio balancing is quite shit, and that's because music is quiet as shit and enemy and sound effects are loud as shit. So you basically never get to hear the music unless you adjust individual sound levels, which I think is just a PC thing. And yeah. That's it. Probably the longest video in this video series, but that's because Yakuza 6 was a very significant release. It really didn't have to do all of the things that it did, but for one reason or another, it did. I'm very grateful for some of those things, but other things, well, let's just say they make me realize how much I prefer Kiwami 2 and Judgment to Yakuza 6. With that being said, thanks for sticking around for so long, and if you enjoyed the video, then obviously you're incredibly based. But you should subscribe, because each subscription to my channel is essentially like one extra signature in my petition to Sega over in Japan to add Shinada back into the franchise. So Sega, if you're watching, go ahead and look at that sub count. That's how many people want Shinada back. It's definitely not just me, I promise. Yep. Join me next time where I talk about the game that was less of a Yakuza 2 remake and more of a Yakuza 6 final mix, that being Yakuza Kiwami 2.